Hello there. Welcome once again to our lesson that is the topic for today that we have been dealing with is a biotic environment. So we say that biotic environment is the living organisms and how they interact with each other with, with the, themselves. And in the process, they form special relationships. Special relationships. So it is these special relationships during interaction that will be able to determine their distribution, their locality, and even their abundance. So we were able to define or identify some of the special relationships, like, for instance, uh, predation. And this is what we did in our previous lesson. We were able to define predation as that predator-prey relationship. Prey relationship. So yeah, that we have an organism called the predator, mostly carnivores, and another organism called the prey, mostly the herbivores, where the predator feeds on the prey. In other words, it depends on the prey as a source of nutrients. And we are able to find out that if we have an ecosystem where we have predator-prey relationship, always we are going to have an increase and also a fall, rise and fall in the population of both the predator and prey, such that as the prey increases, as the population of prey increases, also the population of predators increase. But it does not mean that the population of predators should be the same as that one of the prey. Usually the maximum population, the maximum number of prey in any given ecosystem will be always higher than the population of the predators. This is important to bring about an ecological balance. Otherwise, if the population of predator surpasses that one of the prey, there will be a problem so that it's going to clear all the prey. When all the prey is cleared, again the predator is going to be in problems. It will reduce drastically. We can have cannibalism within the predators where they are feeding on each other and in the process they may get extinct. So we must have a balance. We say that for that balance to be established between the predator and prey, we they usually produce some features that will enable them to survive each other, such that the predator does not clear the prey, and at the same time, the population of the prey is checked. Those modifications or the mechanism that the two organisms will put in place we are calling them adaptations. So remember, we talked about adaptation of the predator. It must be able to produce structures or features that will enable it be able to catch the prey. But at the same time, it, sh it should not be a walk in the park for the prey, so yeah, for the predator. So yeah, that the prey must also be able to produce features or structures that will enable it be able to run away to escape from the predator more uh, some of the time so that it can be able to get chances of reproducing to give forth to their offsprings so it is important that we know that the adaptations are very important for the two of them to create an ecological balance to create an ecological balance so again we were able to mention that Predation on prey is important, otherwise the population of prey will increase so much so that it surpasses the carrying capacity of the 
ecosystem. So the predator usually reduces or decreases the number of prey to the carrying capacity, the ability of the ecosystem to support the prey. If we have herbivores, if they are going to be let so many of them to grow and increase in population, they'll grace the whole field. They are going to interfere with the primary uh, producers, that is. When producers are interfered with, then how to tap energy from the sun, the sun becomes a problem. So predation, we say it is important. It reduces prey to population or levels that can enable the carrying capacity of the ecosystem to support the two organisms. And also we mentioned in passing that again it increases or it improves the quality of the stock specifically for the prey and again improving diversity. So today we want to look at another relationship that's very important, parasitism. In our lesson, we look at parasitism. Now, parasitism is a special interaction or a special relationship. And the word comes from the word parasite. So we need, there must be an organism called parasite. So in parasitism, there is an organism called parasite that depends, most of the time it's the one that depending on another organism called host. So it depends on another organism called host. For what purpose? For two major things, for nutrients, obtains nutrients, for nutrients, and two, for, sometimes, not most of the time, for shelter. And especially if the parasite lives inside the host. So that relationship between one organism called the parasite and another organism called the host, where the parasite obtains nutrients, you can also say food, from the host and also sometimes shelter. So the word sometimes is, or for some parasites, sometimes shelter from the host is what we call parasitism. So the parasites may be found either inside the host or they may be found just living close to the host or on the body of the host. The parasite could be, could be found living inside. So it could be found living inside the body of the host, inside the host. Or it could be found living close, close to the host. So we have three situations where the parasite is either inside the host, close to the host or on body, on the body of the host, on the body of the host. So because of these three scenarios, parasites can be classified into two. If the parasite is found inside the host, we say that parasite is an endoparasite. That one becomes an endoparasite. If it is found close to the host or found on the body of the host, then that parasite becomes an ectoparasite. Ectoparasite. So, because of these two, uh, three criteria, 
we can be able to classify parasites into two major types, endoparasites and ectoparasites. So as we have already mentioned then, types of parasites becomes two types of parasites, a endoparasites. Now we have already said that endoparasites are found living inside the body of the host. body of the host. Now we can just give some examples, e.g. examples. Examples of this, even if we started with human beings, we can, human beings have parasites like tapeworms. We have parasites like liver flukes. Even plasmodium is a parasite, a protozoan. We know the effect of this on human beings, plasmodium, is the one that causes malaria. We have parasites like amoeba, the one that causes amoebic dysentery in living organisms. So the list could be long. Then B, we have uh, ectoparasites. Ectoparasites. We have said that ectoparasites, from the word ecto, external, they are found either on the body of the host or found living around the host, close to the habitat of the host are parasites. These are parasites found on the body, on the body of the host, found on the body of the host, or they live around or close to the habitat to the habitat of the host. We can give examples of this. Examples could include, if for example you started with the one that live close to the habitat of the host, Anopheles mosquito, Anopheles mosquito. We have an offless mosquito. It's a parasite but living close to the habitat of uh, animals, not just not necessarily uh, human beings. And then we have others like tick, like fleas, like lice and several others, leech. So the list is long. Now, of these parasites, some of them are macroscopic. In other words, they are large in size, while the others are microscopic. So if they are microscopic, we refer to them as microparasites. So of these parasites, the endoparasites, and ectoparasites, some are microscopic, they are small. So because they are microscopic, microscopic, then they are referred as microparasites. Microparasites. Examples of this the microparasites include bacteria. We have bacteria that live exclusively 
in bodies of other animals like a bacteria like lactobacillus the one that lives in the reproductive system of female we have others protozoans we have mentioned examples of protozoans like uh, plasmodium like plasmodium we have uh, amoeba we have others like viruses even others in the group of fungi so of the ectoparasites because some could be very tiny we call them micro parasites they are called micro parasites but what he of noting is that the parasites cannot benefit cannot be able to benefit the host most of the time the host is going to uh, be harmed the parasite harms the host so the question is how does the parasite harm the host we have already said that parasite will depend on the host for food and sometimes shelter but to obtain food there are several ways in which it has to obtain food maybe through sucking blood and sometimes living inside the the host so these are the ways in which parasite will cause harm to the host one of them is depriving it deprives the host of its nutrients now take a case of uh, a tapeworm tapeworm living in the digestive system of uh, either a pig or human being so the tapeworm will just be waiting for the food to be eaten ingested to be digested once it's digested it now absorbs the digested food material the one that was meant for the body of the human beings it's now going to be used by the tapeworm it is absorbed by the tapeworm so in doing so it deprives the host of its nutrients the nutrient that was meant for the host will now be taken by the host by the parasite again we have mentioned that some of them like mosquitoes they suck blood and not just mosquitoes even endoparasites like the liver flukes leeches and even the tapeworm they are sucking blood as they suck blood they are depriving the organism of either uh, red blood cells or totality as blood and in the process it may lead to uh, conditions like anemia so may lead to may lead to anemia anemia how by sucking blood through sucking blood through sucking blood another effect of parasite on host if we are going to have let us continually use maybe the liver fluke or the, the tapeworm if they are going to find conducive environment and they reproduce in large numbers they may even block the digestive system blocking of digestive system blocking of digestive system of the host of the host if population increases if population if population of the parasites increases the other effect as they are sucking blood like the anopheles mosquito 
what happens? They may transmit diseases, transmission of diseases. And one major parasite that has caused this is Anopheles mosquito, the one that transmits, transmits parasites, other parasites, plasmodium, which causes malaria. So these are the major effects of parasites on the host. Now, if these are the effect of parasites on the host, then it follows that we must have a balance between the parasite and host. And again, it should be noted that parasites will always be found where there, uh, there is a suitable host. Remember, we are looking at how environmental factors, and in this case, biotic factors, are affecting distribution of other organisms and the major organisms are the parasites. So how do they affect distribution? We are saying most of the parasites will, found, will be found where we have suitable host. And again, if you are going to have a condition where parasites are more, are increasing, the population of the host will go down, will fall because of these conditions. Deprivation of, food, of, of nutrients, uh, causing anemia, blocking digestive system, transmission of diseases. Because of this, most of the host may die, some host may die, and also leading to decrease in population. So, in essence, effects of parasites on population include of parasitism on distribution, on distribution of organisms. So one, we have said, parasites will be found where we have suitable host. Where there is a suitable, a suitable host so that it can be able to derive all the benefits that it requires from the host. Again, we have said, if you are going to have very many parasites, the population of the host will be affected. There will be a decrease in population, increase in population of parasites beyond a threshold, beyond a certain threshold, beyond a certain threshold, leads to decrease, it leads to decrease in population of the host, in population of the host, population of the host. We have seen how this can happen, deprivation of uh, nutrients, causing anemia, causing diseases blocking of the digestive system. Now, because of these last lessons, uh, last effect or last reason, there must be a balance between the population of parasites and the population of the host. Now, what will happen? I want to ask this question. If the population, if for example we have a cow, that is the host, and on this cow we have a tick depending on it, but such as that the tick increases in population or transmits a disease like East Coast fever to the cow. The cow dies. What will be the fat of the tick? The tick also dies. So there must be a balance between the parasite and the host so that the tick can continually obtain nutrients from the cow or the parasite can continually depend on the host without uh, causing death to the same. But if it dies, then it follows that the parasite, is specifically for endoparasites, they're also going to, to die. So to 
produce that balance, again, they'll do it through adaptations. Adaptations. So both the host and sometimes the parasite, in fact, the parasite will produce adaptations to create what you have already referred to as ecological balance, to create an ecological balance. We shall be looking at some of the adaptations of certain or some parasites. So examples of both plant, of plant and animal parasites. Now most of the parasites are usually, or most of the animals that are free living, any animal that's free living, or most of them, they usually have parasites depending on them. So we might have an animal A, which is the host, and a parasite B is depending on it, parasite. But if this parasite is large in size, again, we have another organism, an organism C, depending on that, on that organism that now is a parasite on another host. We can have another organism D that is now again depending on this organism C as the host. So this is the host, B is a parasite, but on this parasite B it is a host for another organism. So this is another parasite. This is another parasite. So this one becomes the primary parasite. Primary parasite. Because it's the one that depends on the major host. And this C, depending on primary parasite, becomes the secondary parasite. Secondary parasite. And D, depending on secondary parasite, can be classified as tertiary parasite. So this is the level of parasitism, primary, secondary, and tertiary parasite. They are all, they can be both found in plants and animals. So we can look at a few examples of parasite in both plants and animals. For plants, one of them is a plant called the Dota plant. The Dota plant. Dota plant usually has thin, has thin stems, has thin stems with numerous with the numerous tiny scaly leaves scaly leaves so what happens when the seed of the daughter plant germinates seed will germinate and after germinating into a seedling is going to detect a nearby plant. Detects a nearby plant. Detects a plant and will now start growing towards it. It grows towards the plant. So in the process, after it grows towards the plant, it will make it, or it makes the plant its host. So how will this plant uh, benefit from the other plant that has become the host? So this plant host will be able to absorb nutrients and water 
for the daughter plant. Remember, we have already said that parasites obtain nutrients. So this seedling that has just germinated will obtain water and nutrients from the plant, mineral ions. Mineral ions. This is not the only benefit. Again, it obtains support. Support from. It's going to obtain mechanical support from the host plant that it has just grown onto. Remember, one characteristic of that plant is that they have thin stems. Thin stems cannot be able to provide mechanical support that's needed by the daughter plant. And support is important in plants because it exposes uh, uh, plants to sunlight for purpose of photosynthesis. Again, it exposes flowers of the plant, of the plant to pollinators. So there are several benefits obtaining water because once it starts growing on another plant, it will start using the water that was meant for the plant, mineral ions that was absorbed by the plants, at the same time obtaining mechanical support from the plant. And as it is doing so, the total plant will be exposed, exposure, will be obtaining exposure to sunlight, to sunlight, exposure to sunlight. It will obtain exposure to sunlight. We know the role of sunlight for plants and also exposure of the plant or of plant flowers to pollinators. Pollinators. So this is how the plant is able to interact with other plants. And in the process, you'll find that the primary host or the host plant becomes seriously covered by the plant, the daughter plant, until you cannot be able to identify the host because all over we have the leaves. If this is, was the plant, there was that growth and then it entangles. It entangles the, the rest of the plant and then now uh, all over it produces its own leaves and flowers. So in other words, it is simply strangling. It strangles the plant so that the plant cannot be seen anymore. But allowing it again, the plant to survive because if the plant dies, just like we have mentioned, if the host dies, the parasite will be in problems. So there must be a slight balance such that it allows the plant to grow some few leaves for its own, uh, for photosynthesis, and also to continually support it in these services that we have already mentioned. The other plant is called the, mist the mistilto, the mistilto plant. The mistilto plant. To mistilto plant. Now, mistilto plant is not uh, a very independent, or is not uh, a only parasite, such that it can be able to manufacture its own food. Because of that, it is referred to as a hemi parasite. It is a hemiparasite. Why? It has ability to carry out photosynthesis. Although the only problem of the mistilto plant is that it lacks a vascular system, well-developed vascular system roots. So because of that, it will depend on another plant for purpose of obtaining uh, nutrients, obtaining water, and also for anchorage. So it is a hemi parasite. Why is it called a hemi parasite? Because it can be able to photosynthesize, able to carry out, carry out photosynthesis, photosynthesis. 
So it will just depend on another plant for purpose of obtaining water and mineral uh, ions. But if we have to describe a little bit of this plant, is that the seeds of this, the seeds of the mistletoe mist plant is usually found in a fruit structure called the berry. And these seeds that are found here usually have a sticky coat. Having a sticky coat is important, especially for the seeds. The birds usually feed on the berry. We have birds called the mistilto birds. Mistilto birds. Mistilto birds usually have a very simple digestive system. Have a simple digestive system. So when they feed on this berry, remember it has the seeds. A berry is a, a kind of fruit that could be equivalent to, for instance, uh, 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 like orange. Orange is a berry, tomato is an orange, uh, a berry that is. Tomato is also an example of a berry. A berry has juicy uh, mesocarp with seeds inside, very many of them. So that's an example of a berry. So the mistletoe plant has that kind. So the mistletoe birds will feed on it and they have simple digestive system. So because of that, the seeds usually remain in the digestive system for a very short time, lasting almost 12 minutes. Lasting for almost 12 minutes. And then the seeds that were carried or that were in the berry will be removed together with the droppings. One important characteristic of mistletoe birds is that they do not release their droppings on the ground. Most of the time, they'll find a branch of any tree and on the side of the branch be able to release the, if that is the branch, it will release the seed or the droppings. So when it releases the droppings, just after 12 minutes. This is important. 12 minutes is important because if the seeds stayed in the digestive system for more than that time, maybe if it is 30 or one hour, the seeds will be destroyed. But just passing through the digestive system for 12 minutes, it is important because the seeds will remain viable. They are now in the droppings. So in the droppings, the seeds stick, stick on the branches, on the branches. Now when they stick on the branches, they germinate. They germinate now into seedlings that will now grow into the mistletoe plant. Now this is very common. Plant, if you walk in any forest ecosystem, not just forest ecosystem, even in woodlands, you will always find this type of a plant. So if that is the host that was a branch, you realize that another more green, even more green plant is growing on this branch that is very distinct from the leaves or from the vegetative part of the other plant. So very bushy sometime, if there are going to be many of them like that, until the wall of the plant becomes a mast in the vegetative part of the mestilto plant. So it will obtain, as we can see from this, is going to obtain from this water from the host, it obtains water, it obtains mineral ions, obtains mineral ions, and you can be able to suggest more other benefits like support. So the mistletoe plant will obtain support, 
you can see there's a stem supporting the crown and that crown is mainly the plant, the mistletoe plant. But again, it's exposing the mistletoe plant to sunlight. Exposure to sunlight. Role of sunlight, we have already mentioned several times for photosynthesis and exposure to pollinators, to agents of pollination. We can mention agents of pollination, like we have insects, bees, moths, and the rest, and also wind, and several others, like animals, when birds are feeding on the fruits, or uh, on the fruits, they are also carrying with it the pollen grains. So these are the major plants in Australia that are distinctly parasitic. We have several others. We have looked at plants in details because most of the literature does not quote parasites of the plants, but many of the animal parasites. Examples of animal parasites are many as we have already mentioned, we can just give examples because they are widely studied. We have mentioned mosquitoes, but not all mosquito, and of less specifically. We have mentioned the leech. We have the tick, liver flube. You have fleas, the rat fleas, and several others. We have the lice. So many examples. If you have understood this, let us just go through some few questions to get these questions. So one of them is this. Define the term Parasitism. Parasitism. Now we have said parasitism is a relationship whereby we have an interaction between an organism called a parasite and another organism called the host, but in this relationship the host is harmed. Is a, a parasite host relationship where the host is harmed. We have looked at the harms that the harmful effect of parasites on the host. We can mention them as deprivation of nutrients, sucking of blood causing anemia, blocking of the digestive system and several others. Then the other question lists ways in which parasites depends on the host. Parasite depends on the host. So there are different ways as we have mentioned for nutrients depends on the host for nutrients, depends on the host for shelter. If they are endoparasites, and then sometimes the host helps parasites through transmission, transmitting from one host to another, from either intermediate to primary host. Transmission from host to host, from host to host. So if it's going to provide shelter, it can provide other uh, services like breeding sites. It can also form breeding site for the, for the host. Question three. 
classify the following either as Ecto, classify the following either as Ecto parasites or Endo and Endo parasites. So the list is as follows, mosquito, leech, we have the mosquito, the leech, tick, tick, liver fluke, and tapeworm, liver fluke and the tapeworm, the liver fluke and tapeworm. So as we have the list, we can just try to find out if it's an ecto. Let us start with the mosquito. So to classify the parasites, we have to find out, are they living inside the host, or do they live inside the host or outside the host? Mosquito, where do they live? Outside the host. Because it's outside the host, then we say it is ecto, ectoparasitic an ectoparasite, leech. Where do you expect to find leech? Inside or outside the host? Obvious, outside. Because of that, becomes an ectoparasite. Tick. Again, that is outside the host becomes an ectoparasite. Liver fluke, where do you expect liver flukes? They'll be found in the host, uh, either in the lungs or in the digestive system. Sometimes it can go to the brain. So that one is an endoparasite. Endoparasite. Tapeworm found inside the host it is an endoparasite. The other question is state the ecological importance. Ecological importance of parasitism. Now, in other words, how does this relationship, parasite-host relationship, help the ecosystem? Does it have any importance? Yes, we have already mentioned that parasite causes harmful effects. But again, without parasites, suppose it is a natural ecosystem where there is no interference by human beings. Parasitism comes in handy because it reduces population of the host to the carrying capacity of the ecosystem. Otherwise, maybe the host could have, the population of the host could have exploded against or away from the threshold of the, or the carrying capacity of the ecosystem. So it reduces it to the carrying capacity, reduces the population of the host to the carrying capacity of the ecosystem. host population to the carrying capacity carrying capacity of the ecosystem so it is like functioning uh, like that one of predation slightly the same function and then again, most of the organisms that will succumb to death by parasites or to elimination through parasitism are the weak organism or the weak species of that particular host. So in the process, the weak ones are being eliminated and in the process leaving a population of more stronger 
population of the host. So in essence, it, is, it also comes in handy to improve the quality of the stock, the quality of the host population improves. Improves the quality of host population. Now the quality here, it is in terms of resisting parasites. Now we have in African, uh, in, tro uh, in tropic African, we have different kind of uh, cattle. We have those ones that are called zebu. The zebu cow or zebu cattle. If you compare it with uh, maybe a fresh hand one, if we have if we have a fresh hand stock and a zebu stock, if the if the two are exposed to parasites, the fresh hand usually succumbs faster. So if you are looking at a stock that is able to resist parasites, then it is going to be the same. Because if you expose the two to the same parasites, tick, for instance, transmitting East Coast fever, the fresh hand will be wiped away. So if your kind of, if your concept of quality is resistance to parasites, then you'll have remained with a more improved stock of the Cebu cattle. Or if they, have, uh, if they have been interpreted, then that uh, hybrid will be better in resisting the parasites because of improved quality. Then question number five. Many ectoparasites, many ectoparasites often visit the host for a short while. Many ectoparasites visit the host for a short while, for a short while and transmits diseases and transmits diseases. So the question is, give two examples of disease carrying blood sucking parasites. Give two examples of disease carrying and blood sucking blood sucking parasites so the examples are very easy to get for human beings or for most of the mammals we have mosquito And in this case, the anopheles mosquito. We know what uh, anopheles mosquito transmits. It comes for a short while and then uh, disappears or goes. We know that that is transmits a plasmodium that causes malaria. Then we have the rat fleas. The rat fleas. This transmits a disease called uh, bubonic or bubonic plague. Bubonic plague. Question six. The diagram shows a life circle. Life circle of tapeworm. Life circle of tapeworm. called the Echinococcus. This is the scientific name, Echinococcus craniolosis. 
So the, the circle is as follows. So this grass. Eggs on grass. And then it goes into another organism when they feed the sheep feeds on grass. So when the feed the sheep feeds on grass, it's going to swallow the eggs. The eggs in the sheep are going to hatch into embryos. Embryo emerges, embryo. This is in the digestive system, but now they'll move into the liver. So the eggs move into the liver and lungs. So the sheep here, when maybe uh, it is fed on or when it releases feces, it releases feces with cysts, a cyst. In this cyst, we have many heads of the tapeworm. Heads of the tapeworm and when the dog feeds on meat or beef of the sheep, the cyst will be transmitted dog here. With cyst, so the dog becomes another host. This is an intermediate host. The sheep here becomes an intermediate host. Just for some time, then it's going to release. In fact, the effect of the tapeworm will not be manifest on the sheep because it's just uh, using the sheep for purpose of reproduction. So the cyst will be part of the meat of the sheep. When the dog feeds on it, then it swallows together with it. So this is the final host. But now when the dog releases or releases stool, it will have stool on grass. So that grass will have eggs of the tapeworm. So this is a simple cycle. So we want to have some few questions on the same. So part A of the question is this. Where does the tapeworm live in a dog? Part A. I'll write it. Some question there. Where does the tapeworm live in the dog? So we expect that because these are the heads of the tapeworm, it has fed on meat with the cyst. Therefore, it will be in the digestive system. The gut. So the question was, where does the tapeworm live in the dog? It lives in the digestive system. So that question, you can easily get the answer from the circle or from the cycle. Then part B, how does eggs get into the intermediate host? How did these eggs get into the intermediate host? That is very simple. When the sheep feeds on grass that is infested with the eggs of the tapeworm. 
so feeding on grass that is infested with the eggs of the tapeworm will now allow the sheep to get the or to be able to swallow the eggs and then it will be colonized by the tapeworm. But sometimes it's not just the sheep alone, even human beings. When you touch the grass, not necessarily grass, any other vegetation and where the dog defecated, it has released the eggs, your hands will have the eggs. They are very microscopic, they are small. So when you feed or you eat without washing your hands, you are able to swallow. You swallow the eggs. Then you do not just be, the sheep does not, it's not the only intermediate host. You are also an example of an intermediate host. Even man is an example of an intermediate host through swallowing. You have eaten food, your hands are contaminated with eggs of the tapeworm and you have not washed. So you get the eggs of the tapeworm. So it is important that most of the time you wash your, your hands before eating, eating. That's why that advice is always there. You wash your hands to remove the eggs on your hands. The last question on the cycle, where are they or where does part C Where does, or we can use the present tense, where are the tapeworm cysts? Tapeworm cysts in intermediate host. Where do you expect them to live? I think, again, it is on the cycle. We have said feeds on grass, embryo emerges, moves into the liver and the lungs. So we expect the cyst to be specifically in three places. The liver to be found in lungs and also sometimes skeletal tissues. Skeletal tissues. That's where we are saying if the dog feeds on meat, that meat is containing the cyst. Then the last Part of that question on the cycle, part D, the question asks, explain why it is dangerous for humans to be intermediate host. If man becomes the intermediate host, explain why it is dangerous for man to be the, to be the intermediate host. So one danger with this is that the cysts of the tapeworm usually stays for the longest time in man. And sometimes the cyst may go into the brain. If it goes into the brain, it will cause damages, brain damages. So that's why it is very dangerous. And again, it's also in terms of spread with man because uh, people can be able to move or can be able to disperse over a wide, over wide areas, it becomes very easy to spread the cyst, which in turn will spread the tapeworm. So we have other questions on adaptation, but we are going to continue on them, which are very important because we have to find out how the parasites are adapted for life in a host. So for that purpose, we shall stop here. But in our next lesson, we are able to, we are going to go through some of the adaptations of the parasites. Thank you.